thing you don't want to do is hold it towards the bottom because you'll smash your fingers pretty much every time. So if you're going to use your fingers, you want to have, have a solid platform. This guy's wiggling a little bit. So, there you go. And like I said, it requires a good amount of force. So set it up and you want to tap it a couple times. Make sure it's stable and it feels pretty sturdy. And so tap it a couple times. Sometimes it takes a few whacks. And so a little flake came off. I'll try for another one. Percussion flaking, you have your hammer stone, something that fits nicely into your hand. I like kind of a, a billet, something a little bit longer, a little bit more of a striking platform. And this stone can be, ideally it's something that's harder than the stone you're trying to break, but it doesn't have to be as long as the shape of it is stronger. So again, you're looking for something that's relatively flat, maybe a, a larger skipper stone. And I wouldn't recommend this percussion with, with smaller flakes. If you're doing, if you have a smaller flake, you want to do the bipolar, just because it's um, it's going to be more safe. You're, you're less likely to. This takes a lot of force, and your fingers are, are right underneath it, um, and it, you're just not going to get the force to to break this on your hand. So with your hand, so with this, I re recommend a larger rock. And one thing you're looking for when <clears throat> you're going out is is a certain angle. So if it's if it's that angle, 90 degrees, this, this one right here, that's really hard to break. So if you're trying to trying to break that, like it's just a lot of force is going to be required to to break this off. So with these rocks, you're looking at the easiest place to get into it. So the the cortex has is a lot stronger and once you break that cortex once you get into the rock then it's going to be easier to break it so one thing i want you to look at is the angle of this this side right here so you see that angle it's it's about 45 degrees or so and you can do 45 or lower I'd recommend. If it's steeper than that, it's going to be harder to break. So again with this, it's not, it's a hard rock and it's going to take a lot of force to do it. So sometimes you can, you can do one strike and you have a nice flake. Um, other times it takes several hits. So with percussion, you, you look for that angle, that 45 degree angle. And another thing to look for is if you flip the rock over, uh, is looking for a ridge, somewhere for that force to, to travel. Because if you have a ridge, so when I, when I say a ridge, that's, that's a ridge right there. Most of this is, is a flat, flat surface, but this has a ridge right here. And you're going to take some force, and you're going to strike it right at that combination of where that 45 degree angle is and where that ridge is. So that's the easiest place to, to get into this rock. And then you want to hold it so your, your fingers aren't cupping this. You want to you want to back a little bit. And again, you want to this is this is gonna require a little more a little more accuracy. So you're gonna you're gonna wanna go ginger at first before you do full swings. But eventually you're gonna have to get to a place of being like, well, I'm gonna go for it. But I'm gonna whack it. So let's see what happens. So after a few strikes, you can say, well, I can, I can try a different place. And often with this method, you can get really thin flakes. So. 
Any questions about that, Matt? Yeah. Nothing fancy, but basically it's just breaking rock and getting some real basic blades and sharp edges off of rocks. And uh, first way I showed was bipolar percussion, which is just having an anvil stone below it, something hard, big rock below it that's not going to move, and getting a thin skipping type stone um, and uh, placing it on the anvil stone, hitting it firmly on the top. So the bipolar, you've got force coming from the top and the bottom, and the theory would be that um, the energy would run right down the middle of that rock, forming two faces that have edges. And the other way is the uh, percussion flaking, which is um, finding a bigger rock that you can hold in your hand and taking another hammer stone and smacking it and knocking a flake off that way. Okay. And that can be used for arrowheads, all kinds of different purposes? Um, typically with a uh, stone that you would be using to make arrowheads, you would start off by doing percussion flaking to get yourself a piece, which you would then begin to work in a more finer, detailed way. You can just kind of run down the line and you just kind of bang at it. Flakes just kind of zinging off. And with obsidian, this is a very fine controlled technique and you can, you can take a, a series of flakes off of one side, you can flip it over, you have your, your angle all set up for you now on this side and take flakes off. But if you try to take another series of flakes, you might get a, a nice, nice piece. You also might have a very jagged, rough edge. So often I'll just, I'll take one series of flakes off of one side and then you have a little hand axe. You can, you can um, saw things with this. I didn't really talk about using these tools, but when you're, when you're actually using these, it's, you can't really you can't carve like you're using a knife. You have, to, you have to saw them. So sawing is your main method. So you, you get a groove started on one edge, and then you rotate it around start up another groove and you go all the way around that piece. In woods with with a pith like elderberry or, or mullen, um, those woods you can go around once and you can snap them right in half. And if you can get deeper than that, this one's a little on the thick side, so it's it's a little hard. But you can you can see um, you can test it. You can use the serrated edge, and you can use um, a flat edge, and see which one works better. Even though we teach in wilderness survival skills, the term connotates uh, in people's minds in a lot of schools like it's very fear based like the world's going to end we got to learn all this stuff um, you know society's going to change a lot of stuff's going to so we got to know this stuff so we can survive and know this you know and it's like we got to learn this stuff because you know otherwise we're all going to die or something like that and whereas hey there might be some valid thoughts and all um, we'd rather work from a place of saying, hey, you know, look at all this beautiful nature that's around us. So if we can really learn about it and have awareness about it, we can actually make a change before something like all that happened. And, um, and it's a much more positive uh, way of doing things. It's a much more positive approach. So I can, I can say, um, you know, like you, to really empower people, to, to, to make a difference and then and it empowers communities as well as opposed to all like you know learning survival skills and hiding in our basement you know because the, the end of the world's coming you know so I'd, I'd rather I'd rather do all this because I believe that we can change the world and make it a better place and come from a positive uh, uh, place and I think that what Wilderness Awareness School does with that message beautifully from the little kid program 
all the way on up to like you know my 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 three-year-old will be going next year when she turns four my, my son who's eight now has been doing it since he was that age and um and i hope he does it all the way through high school that these people can be members of the community to make a real positive change to be really active um members of their community who have wonderful skills and passions and an upbeat spirit that can really uh, make it. And I've seen it. I've been here 17 years. I've seen plenty of teens come through our program from their little kids all the way on up, and they're and they're just amazing adults now, doing amazing things. So that's the difference. It's it's instead of fear, we're talking about positive and being uh, awareness and do, making a difference in this world. With shelter. Um, Say you're in a in a survival situation, and you realize I need to to bed down. I need to find some place where I'm not going to get hypothermic. And so, some some basic things that that you're looking at is how do you lose heat? So, how are you and the environment interacting? So you're you're coming to this equilibrium where where the environment's like you're a warm body, 98.6 degrees, and and the environment can be really cold and so they're, they're trying to find an equilibrium there. So wind can, can whisk away your heat sitting down on a cold rock, sitting down on, on wet ground. Um, radiation, your, your body is, is just radiating heat outwards and that's, that's heat loss. So you want to factor those things into, into your shelter and so Insulation is, is obviously key. One of, the, one of the main things you want to do, even in the summertime, you can go out and, and if you're wandering along, and you need to be lifted up off the ground. So some basic things you want to do is create like your, your thermarest pad. Some folks are like, oh, it's, it's for my back, you know? But the, the real design for that is to lift you off the ground so you're not touching the cold ground. And so you can think of, of the purpose of your thermarest in your shelter. So lifting you off the ground, um, using, using debris, using hemlock boughs, pine boughs, whatever you have in your area, anything to build up a good debris level. And uh, with shelters in general, you're gonna have you're gonna have a ton of debris to gather. Like, there's, there's probably very few environments where you're going to be able to gather enough debris in, in a timely manner. The, the eastern um, deciduous forest, the beech oak forest, those are one of the rare exceptions where you can walk into the landscape and there's, there's leaves that are, that are this high and you can just pile up a huge, huge squirrel nest and dive in and, and you're set. But around here where the leaves break down in three to six months, uh, it's very it's very challenging to gather enough debris, and so you can you can start off with what looks like six inches, and you sleep on it, and then it's compressed down to one inch. So you want to be just be aware of that, and and it might look like a lot of debris, and it's going to take a long time to gather. So sword ferns around here are a great one as well, and an, another basic concept is. That, that heat travels upwards and so you want to you want to block the the heat loss from from above and if you're in an area where the trees branches go down to the ground you can you can find a shelter cedar and hemlock trees around here are excellent because you can you can build just a, a little a little debris on the ground and then your the branches come right above your head and and you have a nice little insulating layer if you don't have to, to build a full-on shelter. Basic design is you have a ridge pole that's, that's a little bit taller than you are, and maybe, maybe about as tall as your, your arm length above, and you can have a Y stick. This can be a crook in a tree, and basically you have, um, have a branch coming down, and you can just lie down, and, and form it as, as long as you need to. And um, then you just pile all sorts of, of branches. Hemlock branches around here are really good because they have lots of, of little branches coming off and they'll, they'll hold debris. So you want, you want some ribbing 
and then you want something that will catch your debris, and then you just pile tons and tons of debris on top of it. And like I said around here, sword fern's probably my favorite thing to, to gather. It's just it's just super abundant and um, just with the with the caretaker's ethic, um, you don't wanna clear cut the sword fern forest. You can you can take maybe half the half the leaves from um, any given sword fern plant and leave the other half for photosynthesis to happen for it. A good rule of thumb is that there's no such thing as too much debris. Yeah. Um, like you can do, especially in a wet, cold environment, you just can't have enough. Yep. You know, just pile it and pile it and pile it and pile it. And these, these debris huts are, if you have enough debris on them, um, my brother was, was sleeping in one and there was, there was a hurricane that, that rolled through the area and they had to evacuate. And a few days later, they went back to, to their debris huts and everything, I mean, there was just huge amounts of rain dumped out several, several inches. And they went in their debris huts and they were dry underneath. So these things can take a lot of water and all the leaves just kind of filter it and, and wash it to the edge. So if you work those, work those angles, um, not a flat roof, you know, you have the angles and that water is just going to trickle down. So they, they can be, they can protect you in below zero temperatures and in really wet conditions. So they're amazing. Don't you then stuff debris inside? Mm -hmm. Yep, and, and once you have debris on the top, then you just stuff it like it's a cocoon. It's basically a, a sleeping bag on its own. Uh, one shelter that that I like to use, especially in the in the warmer times, in the summertime, is a lean-to, and that's a that's a group shelter, and you can have a couple Y sticks, and if you have six people, you know, you just kind of kind of lay down side by side, and and measure out the the width, and you wanna I usually make it a little bit smaller than um, than the actual size, and Using body heat is a good good way when you're with a group. You radiate a ton of heat, and if you can capture that, then you're gonna save on the amount of time that it takes to um, put that energy into your shelter. So spooning, as we affectionately call it, is, is a good method. Does anybody not know what spooning is? Okay. So I don't have to demonstrate? <laughs> I'm happy to, Marcus loves spooning. And I love spooning with Marcus, so... <laughs> you have to do it sometimes. <laughs> oh. uh, my cuddle bunny. Many a shelter night like this. Yes, indeed. <laughs> and then every couple hours you yell, Switch! Switch! <laughs> And it's amazing, really, how much warmth you can get from other people and yep. cramming in to a shelter. If you're on the end, it's the worst. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Really. If you're in the middle, it's like, it's so nice. With a lean-to, or a debris pee, uh, you, can, you can have a fire. And with a lean-to, you can, you can build a little reflector wall on one side to, to have that heat bouncing back right at you and um, you can you can just pile in and these are these are two Y sticks the width of, of your desired shelter length and then ridge poles going across um, talked about this in, in the story this morning with the moss and um, the cedar bark and we piled this with moss and then um, put cedar bark on on top of it and that filled a lot of the, the dead air spaces, and so the wind didn't whip through. So where are you gonna put the fly pole? Just be on the lookout for some of the things we talked about. You can, you can see all the sword turned around us. It's a nice, yeah, nice sword, so we don't have to worry. Got some cedar bark. Cedar bark. Yes, indeed. For, for insulation from the rain. Insulation for uh, basically like shingles on your roof. Put it right on top your your final layer. The rain will just run right down it.
I don't know. We can we can pound it in the ground and do some tests on it. I think I don't think it's durable though. As long as we can get it stuck in the ground and and um, have it so it's not wobbly. Right. We're gonna make a debris hut, which is a one-person shelter, and it's a shelter that you can build relatively quickly and for many different environments. You need a lot of debris for it, um, and you need an A-frame and some, some lattice work and a Y-stick and a ridge pole, and then you just put a ton and ton of debris on it, fill it up with debris, and then you dive in and you're set. It's going to be low impact on the environment around here. There's not a ton of plants that, that we're going to kill. It's a good spot because it's relatively flat. There aren't widow makers around here either. We scanned the area for dead trees and did not find any. So your head is probably going to be like right there. How's it feel? It feels pretty good. This one's going down. Right? It went a little while, but I think it stopped. Ross? Reinforcement there? A little reinforcement, just to just to be double safe. We can put a rock on the, we can start this one with a rock as well, or several rocks. And I'm using a little uh, trailing blackberry as a little binding to, to help it keep it together. We'll have to find some. <laughs> Who's uh? Yeah, you lay down. the longest. I've done it with, uh, with several lean-tos, but um, it doesn't quite have, it doesn't have the same angle going that way, but most of the rain's gonna gonna run off that way anyway. <laughs> yeah, just, just toss it down, just chuck it on there. Wait, we shouldn't use all of it though, should we? Um, you should use maybe we'll two thirds of it. Let's... I would say because we can okay, add wait, wait, more. Wait, wait, wait. On top later. Need this this is our summer shelter. We got a nice thin layer. Ideally, this would be, you know, up to here at okay. this point. This would be like, like no, no, we can't use okay, that much. Okay, can you use the pillow? Survival scene, you'd be like. Hello. Yeah, exactly. yeah. All right, so let's pile some ribs on the on the sides. Okay. Ideally, they're only sticking out a few inches. Too much sticking out, eh? Yeah, I'll just break this in half and use it as a small one. Too much sticking out, eh? They want. Oh, the Canadians. I do it all the time. Yeah. It's a bad thing. <laughs> you it's go not a bad here? thing. I had I had knew a really <laughs> wonderful girl that we were hanging out for a while, and she said that. A little I, bit, and we'll so probably have it on off to one side since those rocks are there. Does that mean like not have so much right here? Like take you need to go and feed off? first, right? Yeah, we'll need to we'll need to modify this one since the the rocks are there. So we'll. Okay, that works. Yeah. Unless you're into it. Extra work. Oh yeah. All right, so start bringing some of that lattice work over. We can finish up the, the ribs. Mm -hmm. And um, as you get more of it, then you can weave it, weave it in. And if we had a lot of time. We had uh, going here. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> so if we you want had oak leaves and small things, then you would want it want it finer, but we have sword frames so you can you can kind of spread it out. And this is our this is certainly our summer shelter. This isn't our <laughs> um, arm length. So it, it will pr protect you that. for sure. If you pile sharp. the ferns on okay. an yeah. arm's length, will they stop the rain? Yes. Oh yeah. Definitely. I think it's good. Think? It's a good <laughs> summer shelter. <laughs> yeah. I think I want to get in and try. I nice. think you should. Oh, Let's why yeah. it here. So what's the bark for? Um, so I have to get that's probably first, the final right? layer. Yeah. Slab it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Just watch out for pokies. This side might be yeah. open more. Yeah. 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 Just getting in there is the bigger chore than <laughs> building. You do yoga, right? Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm somebody who. <laughs> well, air holes, I don't know, but I definitely see a lot of light. <laughs> <laughs> so. I don't know what that means. Well, it's better hope it doesn't rain. I go bump in the night. Ferns rather than moss. Um, if you could get it, I think I'd have a harder time not being able to like toss and turn. Yeah. Because I'm a toss. Oh no! I have to move on my side. Balls that are just draped with it. You just like feel that.
The Wilderness Awareness School was founded in 1983 by a man named John Young and was um, refounded again in 1984 um, with the help of uh, a man named Ingwe. And um, Ingwe was raised in Kenya by an um, indigenous group of people there that are uh, called the Akamba people. And um, uh, John Young, when he... Uh, he was John Young was mentored by um, Tom Brown Jr., who many people are aware of, and he has a, a survival school out on the East Coast. And um, so John was Tom's first student, and uh, came to realize that his vision was leading him to um, start a school and pass along these indigenous skills and this knowledge. Um, to other people and specifically to youth and eventually came to realize that he couldn't do it on his own and that he needed some assistance and uh, a little more wisdom and that's when he met uh, Ingwe. Well Ingwe is uh, not afraid it, of a leopard? It means leopard. This oh. means leopard in, in, um, in, in Zulu and um, in Ke and everywhere he would go in Africa whatever tribe they call him that name for leopard like uh, uh, Ingao in, was his amongst his Akamba uh, people, and he was a person. This is in the 30s or the early, well, but but more like the mid 40s after World War II when he fought in World War II, um, when he came back to Africa um, and had his visions. From that time up until his death in you know just a few years ago, um, 2004. Um, or was it 2005? But anyway, it was a few years ago. Um, he is someone, a perfect example of someone who lived their lives with their passion and their vision. This is someone back in the 40s who saw that he had to work with the children to heal the earth. And he did that through scouting and then eventually through Wilderness Awareness School for decades and decades, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, all the way, seven decades span of living his passion and his vision. And that's just incredible. And the thing that he really brought forth in his, one of his messages was that you can live in two worlds. Because you see, he grew up uh, in a very proper British um, colonial family and culture in Kenya. And he... He, in the summer, whenever he wasn't in school, in the boarding school, when he came home, he took his shoes off and ran wild and free with the, the combat people, who were the servants that his parents hired, but they had no idea that he was running out. I mean, they knew he was out with them, but no idea that they were bringing him up in their culture and in their philosophy and understanding. Like, well, what else could they do? Of course they would be doing that because they were just living their lives. So he understood that we need to live in both worlds, meaning... We can have a passionate connection with nature and, 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 and want to bring forth that into the world and have these skills and bring this message. In other words, we don't need to go off and live in the mountains by ourselves and be a survival person. We can, we, you know, that doesn't help anyone. You can go off and learn these skills. If you're not teaching other people, it doesn't help anybody. Whereas you can take these skills and learn these skills and you can live in the modern world at the same time. You can be, like Ingwe's son, one of, one of his sons who passed away was a naturalist. Uh, the other, um, you know, as well, was very passionate about nature. His son, was well, other son, this third son, just a few years older than me, he um, is a businessman, a finance man. But you see, he's a businessman, a finance man with, 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 with a passion for nature and a real connection, and he makes a difference, you know? He, he, he goes out into the world. He, he took, so, Wilderness Awareness School, when, when you learn these skills, you can be a, a business person, a doctor, or lawyer, whatever you want to be, and have this sense of connection and commitment to helping the future generations. Because that's how it's going to be. You, you can't, you can't uh, expect people who in their modern lifestyle to drop everything and come learn about the wilderness and go live in a hut. You can't expect that. It's not going to happen. But what if we all work with each other and learn these skills and make a difference in the society that we already have, that's here already? That's more realistic. So he was 
a perfect example of that. And I think he had that duality, that struggle over the years, like, well, am I this or am I that? But, you know, I think eventually he figured out that was his, that was his path. And that's what he brought. So in Wilderness Awareness, when John Young came around and told him what he wanted to do, he was fed up with the Boy Scouts and what they became. They became a, a social club. He wasn't interested in them. He, he denounced them. You know, his, his great uncle started the Boy Scouts, Lord Baden Powell. He was Norman Powell. <laughs> He let, it, he let it go, and he joined Wilderness Awareness School because he knew that we were bringing forth the spirit of what the scouts and what he was doing all those years. He knew he had that. You know, this school is founded by somebody born in 1914 who lived the most amazing cinematic life you can possibly imagine, who has the most authentic wilderness experiences and the most dramatic wilderness experience you could possibly ever dream of. And this person co-founded our school and brought those philosophies to what we do. So when every little kid gets off the van at 2, two or 3 o'clock at the end of the day at youth school or Roots and Wings, when they come there and they get off that van, when you see the sparkle in their, when you see the sparkle in their eye when they get off that van, you know, and after they've had a wonderful day out in the woods, and they're just on fire and lit up, you know, at the public school, when those kids are getting out, they're all like this, you know, or whatever. <laughs> but when you, when they have that passion and they get out of that van, you know, when I look in those eyes, I see Ingwe's eyes, those leopard eyes, those, the eyes of the leopard, because uh, this, his spirit lives in, in all that those kids are doing out there every day, and he knows that. I thought, it was, I thought it was magic, you know, like it's, it's one of the oldest, oldest arts of, of humans and like it's so magical, like it's just, it's hard to put into words doing it for the first time and um, I didn't have other folks around that were, that were doing it with me and, and showing me, I, I learned from, from a book and it took, took a good month of consistent practice to get it and that first time getting a coal and blowing it into flames was, was an incredible experience. Because in the summertime, um, you could, if, if you're solid, you can get hand drills, you know, you can get hand drill coals, gathering those materials and, and getting coal the same day. But um, bow drill is, you can, you can do a marathon on bow drill, whereas the hand drill is like a hundred yard dash and you're done. Like you can do, you can do hand drill for under five minutes and have your hands covered in, in blisters, especially if, if you haven't done it before. Um, whereas bow drill, you can, you can drive the moisture out of the wood. This is, this is a string from the east side of the mountains, um, dog bane. You'd want, you'd want probably a pinky thickness cord around here. My favorite primitive cord is cedar rootlets dig up the, the roots, and if you get the right one, this one's retired as well, but you can see how pliable it is. You can tie, you can basically tie knots in it. And um, some of these guys, it looks pretty thin, but if you keep them wet, they last a really long time. String is, is one of the most challenging parts of your bow drill kit, especially if you're doing it in a primitive method. And like I said in the story earlier today, um, you always have string on your shoes, unless you're wearing flip flops. But like if you're if you're out hiking, you have have some of those boots, and you got nice sturdy string. Um, one thing I do with, with my shoes is I'll I'll take the the normal kind of thin shoelaces out, and I'll put parachute cord in them. Have your fireboard. And fireboard will quickly build up sockets, holes on the top, and then you'll need to cut a notch in there. And the notch is for collecting dust and fine, fine powder that comes from the spindle and the fireboard rubbing together. It's black, fine charcoal powder. Um, this is your handhold. Called so because you hold it in your hand. And this is your spindle. And two ends, often, 
I'll carve this more to a point. So you can see in this. You're just burning your, your socket right now. So you don't want to wear yourself out. Kind of mark the, the edges. And then find the center point in between those two. You're looking for the ridges. And so the ridges of the wood are going to be at the top and bottom, and then the third ridge is going to be in the middle once those top and bottom parts are removed. So with all this, we didn't really talk about conservation of energy, but um, that's, that's one of the key principles to, to survival, whether you're a human or an animal. There's, there's always, always ways to save energy. The more energy you save, the less you're going to have to replace. Get a little little nest for the coal and it's ready to go. I'm right handed so I have my left foot on the fireboard and my knee is, is directly behind it. You don't need out here because then you're just going to hit your leg. So scoot back a little bit and then your third third piece of your tripod is kick your leg out behind you so you're nice and sturdy. Then with your left arm reach it around your leg and you lock this. So ideally the only thing that's moving is your arm. If your spindles, if your hands way over here and your, your hands wobbling all over the place, you want to move your foot in a little bit closer. You don't want to be inside wobbling all around. Try it out. Sometimes you have what you think is a coal and it tends to go out, so you just gotta put it right back on and do a little bit more.
The best was watching a kid that spent like hours working on it. Have that happen again and again. What do you think about the handrail? Just in general, I notice a lot of people drill. talk about not being real fond of the handrail because it requires so much work. Well, I think that the handrail is a a lot more of a simpler technology because you only got the two pieces. You got this, your your spindle uh -huh. and your fireboard, whereas the bow drill has a lot more components to it. Um, the handrail is typically used yeah. and is a lot more efficient this in drier climates. Progressive. You can definitely use a handrail, and people have been very uh, um, successful with hand drills here in the northwest but and a lot of the native peoples used hand drills but um, they typically had kits that they had dried out near their fire and used and uh, had to dry out a lot because there's so much less friction that it needs to be dry whereas with the bow drill um, it's bigger there's more surface to surface uh, contact going on so it's just a little bit more of a dependable kit especially in uh, moist climates well, this is the hand drill method. This was probably the original way of making fire, rubbing two sticks together. And um, same, same as the bow drill, but you have uh, just a spindle and a fireboard. And instead of using a bow and a handhold, you're, you're simply using your hands, rubbing it back and forth. And what I'm doing right now is, is called floating, leaving your hands at the top. And I usually start off up at the top and just kind of warm up the fireboard and as starting to, to warm up then you can start going down and speeding it up. And then you just start back up at the top. So you're working your, your hands down. Exactly. And you want to keep good amount of downward pressure and that's the challenge that's why this is often harder than the bow drill even though it it's simpler in theory what kind of wood do you want to seek out for the bottom there um the fireboard and the spindle you want it to be kind of a medium hardwood right now i'm using uh, mock orange uh -huh. and the fireboard is a cedar I heard about how the natives, sometimes the women would create fire this way, but it would take a couple of them. Yeah, this is a cool and one to do with a, a big group of people. Uh -huh. So you can just use shorter bits. And when I, when I try to finish, I just use the meat of my hand and I can get the most pressure. But in general, you want to use the entire length of your hands. That's going to be way more efficient. Some folks just use one hand, and it just doesn't work. You know, you want to you want to have it nice and smooth, mm -hmm. nice and even. And you can see at the end, I'm just slightly lifting tips of my pinkies up, and that's allowing me to stay at the top, as opposed to having to go down every time. Because every time you stop at the bottom, then you have to pause, and and you lose a little heat. So mm -hmm. this is a way of, of conserving the heat. <laughs> Although my knuckles are, uh, so you're saying like right here, you can float like that? Yeah, it's it's harder, you know, it's it's a lot easier to use your whole hand, but if, you're, if your bones are hurting, you know, sometimes you do what you gotta do. Nice. Oh, yeah. I wish I the other side there. just kind of put that fine dust on there, and it helps <coughs> helps just make a bigger coal. So when you're blowing on it, it helps ignite it. The uh, curriculum and the uh, educational model that the school operates off of is um, based on kind of the four cardinal directions and the four uh, ordinal directions uh, east, southeast, south, southwest, west, northwest, north, and northeast and 
in each of those directions is um, what we call a shield or um, a curriculum area. Here, here in Duval, there's, um, in, in the Wilderness Awareness School community, there is a, um, a lot of interest and there's a lot of brainstorming going on about how um, we can come together and truly create a, a sustainable community together here. And what that would look like is uh, still a bit nebulous at this point, but there's a lot of folks in the community that are interested in um, trying to develop some sort of, uh, you know, starting off maybe with a communal garden and working in a lot of permaculture. Angie has just um, received a good deal of permaculture training and wants to bring that and do a lot of permaculture. Uh, she's got some permaculture visions for this land here, actually. And so this is, the, the school as an organization is based here, but surrounding the school is a huge community of people. How can we sustainably, and not even sustainably, um, but <clears throat> live in not a sustainable way, but a regenerative way? You know, how is it that we could live and, you know, we don't want the earth to just sustain. We want it to regenerate and be abundant and nourish itself and perpetuate itself in an amazing way. So um, John Young once made, a statement he says would you if somebody asks you how your marriage was would you it, like say oh it's sustainable would you be happy with that no you want it to be a regenerative thing and a nourishing thing that's constantly growing and becoming better and that's the that's the vision that this place holds Well, my name's John Gallagher. Uh, I'm a uh, licensed acupuncturist and um, community-centered herbalist and uh, from Carnation, Washington. I started working with Wilderness Awareness School in 1991, so I've been involved for about 17 years. And uh, with them, I helped, I was a design editor and helped create the Kamana Naturalist Training Program. And I worked a lot of other positions from teaching to uh, doing marketing materials and just about everything else you can do and run in the school. Um, and I got involved initially, um, well, though John Young, the founder, was a teacher at my high school, I got involved more like when I was in college because in college I got involved in environmental activism and all. And then I really saw how um, nature education and connecting people to nature and where people had a real um, passion themselves with nature, they would then be better stewards of the earth. So it was less of a fad like in the early 90s when the Earth Day thing came up and all and whatnot where everybody thought it was cool to do or whatever. But I saw that, that people would do this for the long haul, that they would really be involved in their lives and put all their heart into it and really make a difference if they had a connection with nature and they knew the plants and trees and animals and birds and the, in their area and knew how their ecosystems worked. Some people might think this is a leaf. This right here is a leaf. That's not a leaf. It's a leaflet. Because this whole thing here is a leaf. Because another thing I look at when I'm looking at plants is the shape of the leaf. Is the leaf a uh, whole? Like I'm going to take a look at um, this Avon's uh, right. Well, let's look. Some examples. This leaf right here, okay, you know, you, you would look at that and go, okay, that's the leaf. That is the leaf. Oh, and like a maple leaf or something, it is like lobed, okay? The edge of the leaf is toothed, okay? Toothed? Toothed, like teeth. Oh, toothed. Yeah, because uh -huh. it looks like little yeah. teeth, you know. Yeah. So toothed, lobed, okay? If I'm looking at, well, the blackberry is not a good example because this blackberry, once again, you might think that this eats a leaf, but that's, that the whole thing's a leaf. And we've got three leaflets. So Look at how it just gets shorter and shorter. Just... Some people call it elderberry or elderflower. Well, that's just describing what it is. There's a flowering or is it burying, but elder is the plant. Different kinds of elders. This is a local, uh, our local one is red berries in a raceme. It's Sambucus racemosa versus uh, other Sambucus varieties which grow in other places. Like on the east, I gather elderberries, these blue umbels, buried umbels on the other side of the mountains because that's where they're native. And that's what I use for remedies and wines and stuff. And why? It's because, well, I can get more berries first of all. And second, those seeds are toxic. So we don't want to, I just don't like to mess with it. 
okay? But you can make jellies and wines and stuff with it. It's just that you gotta cook it and get rid of strain the seeds, okay? Just, just to make sure that you know. But the, the, the foliage part of it looks just the same. Colds, fl remedies, flu remedies of flowers for fevers. We use the dried flowers uh, for fever uh, remedy when my kids get fevers and a tea, okay, elder flowers. You can use the flowers from this one because you know, I don't need a lot of elder flowers, so I, I can pick these when they're flowering. Um, and the berries I might have mentioned I use, use jelly, um, syrups, wine. Okay, so there's all kinds of things that you could do with elderberries. Elder's one of those plants that you're going to get to know well over the years. You could work with it slow. It's like an elder. It doesn't want to be, there's so much you can do with it. It's such a depth. And I know maybe you probably already know about huckleberry. And there are different, you know, you see maybe seen a blue huckleberry, there's a red huckleberry. But they're related to blueberries, what we're going to pick later. Um, here's an example um, of a whole leaf, smooth around the edges. So that's one leaf, and I just call it whole leaf, or just think you can look at it as being smooth around the edges. And it's because you want to um, take a, try to get a mental snapshot of the plant in your mind. You know, when you, say you're hiking or you want to know what a plant is, and you know. You don't always have to rip them out of the ground and take them with you and identify them later. You know, you could just look at it and go, okay, opposite branching, divided, you know, or in this case, alternate branching, whole leaves, um, okay, round red berry. And if you looked at the flower, it would be, um, which are, there's none flowering now, but it was like a little bell, just like those blueberry flowers, you know, just like this bell, you know. So when you see, when you hear something, oh, it's in the same family as this, you could usually expect to see a similarity in the flower structure. So Ericaceae, which is the blueberry family, huckleberry, salal, all, all related. And they look so much like each other if I held them next to each other. Um, and here I can see a little salal flower in that bell shape I was talking about that huckleberry has. It's nice because the salals are bigger, but if you go to a blueberry farm like we will later, you'll see sir, similar flowers. You'll see that it has alternate branching and that it has whole entire leaves, like this one. But then when you get past that opposite alternate flower type, and then you can begin to use your senses and say, look at that leaf, and it's leathery, it feels leathery, it's pale underneath. These are things that, when you're using your senses and learning about plants, that eventually they really stick, especially when you're picking them for things, or making remedies. You even get to notice these things more. Now, this is one in the blueberry family that I know that, you know, this is safe to put in my mouth. Now, here's a little side thing. Now, Ingwe taught me this. Ingwe, is, have you heard of Ingwe? William Ingwe Library in there. He's co-founder of our school. And he told me that, that well, he would do, because he was a Boy Scout leader for decades, since like the 30s. Um, and um, as they would take a little bit of the leaf and they crush it, smell it, and wait a little bit. If they didn't get any strong sensation, they take a little tiny piece, touch it to the tip of the tongue. Now, he's from Africa, okay, where there's a lot more poisonous, dangerous types of things lurking, plants lurking about <laughs> than, than here. So, uh, you know, and you do it, and wait. It was okay after that. Chew a little. Wait about 10 minutes. You know, and that's how he wasn't sure. That's how the method that he would use. This is kind of a common thing that people will use. Um, I don't know any deadly poisonous plants that won't tell you that they're deadly poisonous very soon. You know? Well, I mean, there may be some that might, if you ate it, be a little nauseous, but I mean, chances are you won't really run into that, especially in this area. So this, oh, this is a cedar tree, and I'm pointing that out. But I know a lot of y'all live around here and know that because cedars, you know, it's kind of like salmon in this area. If you live in this area, you know what cedar trees are, just like you know what salmon. Are, you know, but maybe if you're from the East Coast, you haven't seen a Pacific red cedar before. And um, and this is the tree of life for the people that lived around here. Like in different parts of the world, different native people have these different trees of life that they are. Um, so, you know, that, that, that gave them so much of what they used and what they needed. And for the natives around here, everything from, uh, well, 
food sometimes, but there's certainly medicine. Utilitarian mostly, houses, canoes, uh, even diapers, <laughs> pounding the inner barks are all survival things and tools and art, and you name it. You might want to step off the trail. <laughs> Because whenever you see Devil's Club right here, you, you'll, there, there will be roots, stems growing right around it, and then you could step near it and it'll just whack you. And if you get thwacked by Devil's Club and that thorn gets in your finger, it will get infected. It will get infected, okay? Is that where the name comes from then? Yeah, the whiteys coming across, they, they said, oh, they'll thwack, and they went, whoa. Devil, that's Devil's Club, you know? <laughs> Whereas the native people around here had such a spiritual connection to this amazing plant. Like, when this isn't an old growth forest, this, like, it's everyone, everyone's seen a huge Devil's Club stand, but it's like majestic. It's just the breathtaking. The Snoqualmie people, which were the natives closest to where we're, we are right here, um, their translation for this plant was the most sacred power. So you have the native people saying, mm -hmm. the most sacred power, and the pioneers going, devil's club. Mm -hmm. So it tells you something culturally here. Mm -hmm. um, so this was serious medicine and deserves a lot of respect. Now there are, now, unfortunately, it's catching on because you know what? It's a relative, a ginseng. It's panics. a panax. Apolopanax horridum. Horridum. They have it. mm -hmm. <laughs> Horrible. Damn Bell's Club. To the untrained eye. Oh, it must be holly. Because <laughs> it's got these leathery, prickly leaves. It must be holly. It looks nothing like holly. But maybe it's some kind of holly. But we don't really identify plants just by the leaf structure and what they feel like. Um, but, um,. This is actually alternate branching, though when people look at this, they think it's opposite. But that's a whole leaf. That's one big leaf right there, that Oregon grape. Oregon grape is one, like my favorite native plant. <coughs> and grows in the forests. And what I use is, um, let's see. Well, I call Oregon grape because when it's grown in the sunny area, sunny area, it gets little berries on it, and they look like yellow little grapes. The yellow flowers that are really sweet to eat. Just pop those in your mouth. They're really yummy. The flowers? Yeah, yeah really yummy. And the berries are a bit tart, and but you can use them in things like wines and jams and stuff, where your jellies rather, where you're adding um, like sugar and all. It's more palatable. It makes a nice wine. They're not but not this one so much. See, this is a Mahonia nervosa. This is a forest native one. The one that has the bigger berries, if you get a chance to get them because they're easier to pick, is the, the aquifolium, which is, um, which is what you often see growing outside, like what people call native landscaping around here, and they put Oregon grape and they always put the big one in. And, but that's not native here, really. Now is not the time where I'd be gathering it for food or medicine because it's flowered and it's seeding. I want to do that before it flowers. And when that is, is the shoot start, it starts coming up in late February. Between late February and like late May, when it's probably about yay big, um, it's cool to harvest. Now prime time, like late March, April. Find a nice patch of nettles. Okay, get your gloves on if you want. Now you can see here how this, there, now, this is opposite leaves and square stems. Every member of the mint family has opposite leaves and square stems, but this isn't a mint. Once again, I don't get, you know, no, every, there's always an exception. When you're gathering it, when it's like this tall, right, or really this tall, you always count down like maybe one, two, three of these leaf sections, two or three of them. <laughs> And when I put my hand up on this, like underneath there, before these flowers are dangling there, you just take it by the stem and wrist snap it. Snap it like that. It snaps right off. Because if you pull it all, you'll rip the plant right out of the ground. It's so shallow rooted. Okay. And you can find a patch and keep doing that and keep doing that. And you can get a lot of harvests out of that. Okay. 
And what I do is when I'm out there and I gather, um, you know, a couple of big garbage bags full. Sometimes like a big ba bag of them. It may take me an hour or two to get, get a big, big, huge bag. I'll dry a whole bunch of them to use. But then what I'll do with a whole nother bunch of them every time is I make food with it. This is if I could get one thing out of y'all today that you could get and understand out of what I'm getting with all this is when people talk about medicinal plants and you always think like you got to have some kind of disease or condition to use them and herbs. I mean, come on, if you waited for that or if you just made tinctures, with you, you, you know, herbalism wouldn't be very exciting. Really high in calcium, magnesium, iron, highest source of plant iron, vitamin A, vitamin D, tons of trace, you know, you name it. It's high in it. This is super, it's free, right? And you know, and, 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 and making an infusion of this every day, and you're all going to drink nettle infusion later, okay? You're going to see what it tastes like. You're going to try that. And you're drinking that every day. It's cheap and healthier. You're actually assimilating all the vitamins and minerals because it's food, right? These little pills they give you, I think it goes in one end and goes out the other. You're not even really, you know, digesting the gel cap by the time it gets to the point. I mean, by the time it gets in the small intestines, it has to be down to the molecular level. If, if, if the gel cap's not dissolving, it'll get to your small intestine. It's at the food level. You're not getting anything from it. Do you not want to eat it raw or should it be cooked every time? Or? You're cooking it when you're using it. Either you're making a tea, which is a fusion, which is a stronger tea. Okay, or you're, you can make steam, when it's like, you just make steam green, you can just steam them and put them on your plate and eat them like that. Put a little Parmesan cheese, that can be that simple. Any soup recipe, put it instead of greens. You can make nettle soup, you know, always cooking it. You yeah. Eat you can eat these raw, yeah, but I mean, you're not, that's not that pleasurable and it kind of tingles your throat after about one or two of them. <laughs> she took it and grabbed it from the top. I didn't grab it very well. She grabbed it from the top and then she's folding it in because the stinging hairs are on the bottom. And she's folding it in on itself. And she's going to crush it a little bit. And for her next trick, she's going to eat it. <laughs> I've had somebody tell me it's like the most healing herb. Okay. And um, one, of those, one of those herbs where it would definitely be on my top five list if I only could be somewhere with five herbs, what would they be? So I think of, when I think of comfrey, I think of um, broken bones, fractures, sprains. Um, um, it's an incredible cell, for cell proliferation. It has uh, something in it called uh, a lantuin, and which is, um, which is as very good as skin regeneration. Now, if you use a comfrey salve or using comfrey on wounds, always make sure that it's cleaned out and disinfect everything you can do before you use that stuff because you don't want to trap in any of the infectious materials because it will work that quickly. If I also make infusions of comfrey leaf, not root, comfrey leaf, and I drink those in, if I have some kind of, um, if, I'm, if, I'm, if I'm using an external, because it's great to nourish internal and external when you've got something. Especially because yeah. I was a broken bone or sprain or bruise or whatever is really going on internally. So you're really helping in them from both ends. Um, also, because of the mucilage, like very good for digestive tract disorders, soothing, ulcers, things like that. Uh, when I have a, some chronic cough stuff, which comes up in like, you know, in the winter when things are really damp around here, I drink concrete uh, confusions, helps my lungs. This is St. John's wort, which I know a lot of you um, already identified. And um, see, in western Washington, uh, in eastern Washington, it grows like all over. It's like a weed, big weed, you know, Oregon, everything. Um, in western Washington, you just don't see it in every field that you go. You usually see it on roadsides. You see it um, trail sides. Uh, you know, I usually go find a place where I know they're not spraying. Usually, I, I have a couple spots that are off a road or whatever that I know that's safe to to. Uh, you know, it's another wild crafting tip: don't gather near the roads, right? Okay, for obvious reasons. Um, so, I have a good spot where I gather this. Now, how I tell it's St. John's, where now it's you know this is just picked right from the ground like that, or it might get maybe that high or something around here. Um, is that it's called Ipiricum perforatum. And if I pick the leaves, 
hold it up to the light, I see little perforations, little holes. But the telltale sign for sure is if I take the flowers, crush them in my yellow flowers and crush them in my fingers, my finger turned purple. Caught red-handed. Okay. <laughs> so, actually I was caught red-handed the other day because I was picking St. John's Wort flowers and some lady pulled up and said, I had a bag and I'm collecting these flowers and she pulled up next to me and said, what are you doing there? Are you spreading dog poop or something like that? And I'm just like, no, I'm picking St. John's Wort. Have you heard of St. John's Wort? And blah, blah, blah. And she said, well, she just wasn't interested and she drove off. You know? It's kind of funny. Um, so it was a teaching opportunity. I just, and uh, I use that for muscle aches, and Rob's very good for nervous kind of nerve kind of situations that are going on. And you, you're, uh, you sunburn, minor burns. We even use the oil uh, as like a sun protector. We put it on before we go out in the sun. It kind of works with your skin. I'll be, I, I, I put this out on the internet the other day. It's a little video. Did did where did you see it? Uh, it was in the last newsletter, and I put a little interview of me talking about it. You know, put it on YouTube, you know. And we talking about it. I got so many emails back saying, you can't use it for that. And I'm like, well, yeah, I do all the time. It works great, you know. It's like Camp Mile without the little white uh, mm -hmm. disc gray flower things on it. It's also in the Aster family, which is a dandelion and all. If anybody's never done it, I mean, you, know, you just do it like this, you smell like apples or pineapple. Mm -hmm. Just crush some of that. We're going to pick some of this to take back for some tea tonight. So you can have wild chamomile or pineapple weed. Oh. And the thing about pineapple weed is the only, you usually only see it grown in your driveway, driveway, you never pick it. But you come here, and even right in this area, this is, good, this is a good place to pick it. So you can actually use it. It's usually like, oh, you know, it's like in the it's in the cracks of the driveway. And, you know, like my driveway, it's that's what's in the cracks. Um, so I've, I have this wild, wonderful wild chamomile here. So this is great. And it's I believe it to, it to be stronger than um, chamomile as well in, in, in action. Um, another name for it is pineapple, pineapple weed, people pineapple call it. Weed. Yeah. It has these parallel veins that can rip up like, you know, into sections like that. You know it's plantain. Plantain just grows in the cracks of the sidewalk everywhere all across. Uh, people used to call it white man's foot because wherever white man went, it would be behind him. This is a native. It kind of trailed behind him wherever he went. And when you think about this plant, I think like it grows in disturbed uh, soil. Um, you're always going to see it. Where metals touch the soil, you're going to see it grow. Um, very, you're going to see it, you know, inevitably come up. Uh, right past it. Now, what it's really doing here is it's, it's really healing the skin of the earth. You know, it's bringing it's bringing nutrients up, and it's and it's and it's making the soil kind of regenerate. So, in the same sense, this is a great example. And it's what oh, like herbs, like they're they're not just here for us to help with a certain condition. They're helping, you know, it's, the planet is putting it here for a reason. And it just, and a lot of the times, it helps us in the same way. So for us, it's very good for skin scrapes, cuts, wounds. It draws, it's very drawing. Because it draws nutrient up, when you, when you, uh, if you have a bee sting and you chew a bunch of this up and put it right on the bee sting, the stinger will pop out and the swelling will go away and the pain will go away. I've seen it happen with my kids, several kids, before. And um, uh, any kind of bites that are called dra drawing, actually splinters, whatnot, um, you can use plantain. The little V on the V. See the little V, little chevron um, character symbol right there? They call it like the geese and then that's formation, like think of it in the shape. And that's how you know it's red clover. But you're not really using the leaves. What you're going to do when you have that field full of those nice pink flowers, is you know pink to red flowers, is you're going to go and you're just going to. You can just two hands. You can have a little basket here, and you can go and grab them and grab them and grab them and grab them like this and keep harvesting. You can fill up nice. So they dry really nice on a screen, and um, it's high in a, in a lot of vitamins and minerals as well as very nourishing for the blood. It's one of those nourishing herbs you would use in, in an herbal infusion, like a to, to, should have a daily standard brew of, 
of some nourishing herb every day, and it's one that you can use for that. Nettles is, of course, number one, but you know, but there's a lot of other ones. Burdock root, dandelion root. So when you're picking them, I'll, I'll be in a field and I'll kind of do both hands like that and just kind of keep snapping them off and I'll take them like this. And before you know it, you have a nice, and they dry, they're so beautiful oh, and they dry and you put them in a, in a, uh, 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 in a jar. You can also take these and, de and get a deep fry batter mix and you can make fritters just like you can with dandelion flowers. You can take dandelion flowers too, or these, have a nice batter, put them in there, just fry them in some oil and then they're really tasty. You use a little syrup or whatever, butter. You know, some plants it's like, all right, that's nice, and you learn something about it or whatever. And some you can just every year be doing new things with. And these are one of those ones, lamb's quarter. And this grows, and all these ones I'm showing you right here grow all over North America. Yeah, a little you can put some in the salad. Oh. Now, wow, now that was, so now is yet another plant in this small radius. See how this place is great? You don't have to move. This is a little bigger than the ones we're going to harvest because this is going to go in your to meal tonight. But when we're harvesting, we're going to go for the little ones that are like this or smaller because you know they're they've kind of like they flames. You know, there we can chop those right up. And so we'll actually we'll probably want Angie or work. We can work with Angie. Just, uh, I think it's a little tougher like this to just actually strip the leaves. And um, perhaps this has like twice as much calcium. Uh, if you make a make an infusion, uh, well, twice as much calcium would you find the same volume of milk? Okay, and it's high, high in calcium. And they and, and if you look at the nutritional charts, it's it's literally skyrocket off the chart with what's at the supermarkets. You know, with the herbs and plants and vegetables. And that's like nettles, lamb's quarter, dandelion. I mean. The, the stuff at the supermarket, any vegetable or anything that they're growing here for people to take home, pale in comparison to nutrients when it comes to lamb's quarter, nettle, dandelion root, dandelion leaves. It's amazing. Chickweed um, right down here. This is, we're going to find some more lush, so we're going to pick some, we're not going to pick our lamb's corn chickweed right here. I'm going to give you some bags, and there's lots of little lush chickweed patches and lamb's quarter growing in, these, uh, in, in amongst these peas. It has an affinity for the lungs, okay? You know, so right when you need it the most, that time of year, you know, like late winter and all. It's when, it's when it, it, it flourishes the most around here anyway. Even in the East Coast, I would see it growing in little pockets and places. It's most vibrant. In the summer, it can get really dried out. But here, you know, we get enough moisture, and it's in the farm. It's protected amongst these peas. It, it, we, we, um, you get, so you still have some nice little lush patches. And um, just, like, they pick this here and actually add it to the salad mixes and the, and the thing. And in the supermarket, I've gone in. Uh, I've gotten bags of salad in, like, the mainstream QFC um, supermarket chain around here we have, you know, like Safeway or whatever. And I've gone in there and got salad mix, and there's chickweed in it. So I've seen it in there. Dandelion is my, probably my favorite herb because I've got the most stories in my life that have to do with dandelion. It's kind of my entry into doing all this. And um, it is, it's another one of those superfood plants. And, and, and just really what it symbolizes, it's amazing that you have this herb that does so much for your liver, so much for your kidneys, two organs that get stressed the most in our culture, and what do people do? Kill it. They're poisoning it. right in their own yard. They're taking this some kind of anger out, <laughs> and that's what it's really a remedy for: anger and liver and all that. Chinese medicine, the liver associated with anger, and um, it's <laughs> so um, that's you know. I, so for me, like in our logo, learningherbs.com, our logo is a dandelion. That's that's why you know. And so try for me, it's a transformational herb, and it's really something that. People can, like a doorway, people could connect. Um, so most people buy one of these because they want to get rid of their dandelions. And I, I, d I have one of these so I can t dig them up and eat them. Um, and uh, let's see if I can get, oh, I broke, see, yeah, it's, it's tighter soil here if it was in there. That's why I always like gathering roots and things in farms and gardens because you can just pop them right up. Um, but uh, 
the roots, uh, we like to we wash them off, you know, chop and wash them. We eat them. We just pick them out of our garden all year. So as we're weeding our garden, we, we take a few roots up at a time, chop it up and put it in whatever, stir fries, very roasted, wonderful flavor. The roots. The roots. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's great. Any time of year. Um, and uh, the leaves, you know, you just eat any time. Um, but, you know, you don't want to eat something that's all, like, divided and all gross looking like that. You try to find the younger, tender leaves. And highest source of plant vitamin A. That's good to know. And so the flour you can eat. You can take the flour, uh, eat it, or we, you know, break the petals out, put them on a salad. Uh, Kimberly makes these great dandelion flour cookies. We have a lot of good dandelion recipes on the website and in back issues of the newsletter. Of any herb that's been used, studied, and used more than anything in so many creative different ways. I mean, there, there are festivals, and there are, you know, in, in parts of the country where people have a dandelion festival. People come from all over and share all their dandelion recipes. Tell you us know. your website again. LearningHerbs.com. So I'd like, let's see, one, two, how about uh, two people on pineapple leaf? Four I'm people doing, for chickweed? I want to do chickweed, but I, I, I got to do those. Just to figure chickweed, out let's get closer again. Chickweed, chickweed, yeah, chickweed, chickweed people. people. Everyone else in the for You can't kind of where it, where it looks it's nice, it's like it's there up. Okay. And like that. Okay. Lots of that. Okay. Chickweed. It's going to be in your salad for dinner. Okay. Um, mm. oh, yeah. Nice. Yeah. You want to help? Yeah, help us. So lamb's quarter, young ones that aren't flowered. The wild chamomile. Oh, aren't flowered. So not like this. <laughs> not like that. They're hard to find now because it's just a wild chamomile. And when you when you're picking it, you want to pick it in a place that you know there's not going to be. You know that's cleaner because we're on a good organic farm here, and uh, usually it's you know you don't know if they're spraying or if there's cars going by it. But we know there's you know just a few tractors a day, no exhaust, and the tractor tires aren't going over it. So I'm, I feel confident about it. It's the only place I ever take. <laughs> mm. What are those ones that are kind of? Um, you know where you can kind of. Plants you went over. Well, I mean, plants, yeah. Your, your, your garden, your gardening, you're here. Your, your oh, we had um, the cat, the uh, chicken, and his little lamb sucker, and they would be like really sweet. The honeysuckles, I guess. Oh, yeah, yeah. Is that what it was? From the east? Yeah, yeah. Really, yeah. 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 really yeah. sweet. Yeah. 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 Like, yeah. Like, yeah. Like, yeah. I was expecting these to be sweet. Yeah, that's used. Oh my god, that is so good. Mm. Oh my goodness. We're going to demonstrate here um, various home herbal remedies. And the reason why I'm doing it this way, showing you like this all at once, is because you're going to see the similarities between the methods that we use for these um, and how really easy it is. Okay. So I talked about St. John's wort uh, oil today. Uh, St. John's wort, right? We met St. Mm -hmm. John's wort, and we talked about how we make an oil, how we can use that on aching muscles, how we can, yeah, can actually rub that down before you go on a long hike, and then you won't get that, that muscle ache, you know? Uh, sunburn, we use it as a sun protector. There's a lot of things you can use St. John's wort oil for. So this is how easy it is. So you basically, you take a jar, Fill it with the flowers, right? I showed you how we strip that, like that. We strip those, got those flowers in our hand, and I stuffed this jar. Now, it stuffed it in not a heavy pack, but a nice light pack, fluffy up to the top, but not like jammed in there, but a nice, um, nice pack. We're gonna use olive oil, and olive oil is most commonly used. Like, what did natives use when they were making salad? They used like fat, like bear fat or different kinds of fats. Um, olive oil also because it's a monounsaturated fat versus a polyunsaturated fat, and um, which means that it's a little more stable and oxidizes less, right? The, the, the polyunsaturated fats like canola oil, corn oil, they go rancid faster. So the monounsaturated fat, like an olive oil or coconut oil, or just that olive oil is so common, easy to get, and a bit cheaper than the others, and most commonly used in the remedies that you see. And I'm just gonna pour it in there. <coughs> so my kitchen here has some bubbling in there. I can go in here and say, oh, I need something to push that down. And I push this down, make sure that it gets in there. 
<laughs> now I didn't chop, notice a, a lot of herbs if you're making an oil, you want to chop them up before using them. If I'm making a comfrey oil, for example, I'm going to let it sit overnight, let it evaporate a little, right, get some of the water weighed out, and I'm going to chop that up real fine and put that in here. But the, the flowers, I don't want need to chop up. Does it need to be dry? Or can it no, I can just use this just like this. Actually, okay, if we went out today, if I went out today and gathered because of the rain, I would let it dry. But I gathered this yesterday and dry, and it's been since, out since yesterday. So, yes, it didn't have a day of kind of drying out a little bit. And why is because, you know, we all know about oil and water mixing. And um, when you make your oil, if there's a little more water in there, when it's done, it can have a kind of salami-like odor. I don't find that with St. John's wort, but uh, something like plantain or, or comfrey or, or other green plant oils, get that. If there is any water in there, take a paper towel. It's a little trick I came up with. Or maybe someone else told me, I don't know. And then I just screw band that on there. And then you see the water is going to be able to evaporate out. Now, usually I could just leave it like this a few days in the sun, in the sun brew it. And I don't do that with all the herbs. I pretty much do that with St. John's work because it's relationship with the sun. And, but every day I will go out and open it and make sure that all the plant material is underneath. Keep it underneath. And make sure the oil is up on top of it because otherwise you want to move, move it around. You don't want something to be sitting, um, sitting above the oil or that can mold go bad on you. Okay, so. You leave it out all night? Um, I used to take it in at night, yeah, because of the dew. Just put and, it out when Yeah, it just put it out when it gets sunny. But another way to do this is I can just let this sit um, out of direct sun. I don't know, some of my fingers doesn't matter in this case. But um, I'll, oils in general, I'll just, you know, not have it in direct, you know, day after day in some way. But because, and then have this for six, sit for six weeks, okay? And then for maybe for the first couple of weeks until it really settles down, I'll open it every day and stir it around and make sure. Until it's going to get to a point where the oil is just going to stay on top and you know you're not going to need to stir it anymore. And then you just, and there you go, that oil's going in. I'll take a label, I'll put on there St. John's Wort, today's day, and olive oil. So you know when six weeks is. So this is finished oil. And this oil we actually keep in in a little, little bottle back in the bathroom. And... And it smells, it smells really good. You know, just uh, pass that around and smell that if you'd like. No, no, no. If you write it down, you have nothing to do with the actual thing. We've made it to the berry patch. It's been a long journey. Um, in, in, in 91, 92, when I was in college at Indiana University, there was like the 20th year anniversary of Earth Day. And, um, and what, what was happening was you had a, a lot of people. Uh, selling t-shirts at fairs and talking about this and that and people were talking about stuff but they, there wasn't a whole lot of, uh, of meaning and heart into it so someone would get into it and they would do it because maybe they thought it was a cool thing or to do or whatever at the time but they wouldn't stick with it so they might talk about all this earth stuff and then the next day you know be into something else or not even changing their behavior or not really you know connected to the place where they were living so that's why I saw people get into it and get out, just quickly get out of it so when I saw the people when I met with Wilderness Awareness School it was like there was a real connection like the people like knew their land and knew their local park so if somebody was going to say hey we're going to develop this area those people would really work or fight or research to work with people to see what they could do to save a particular patch of woods uh, from development which is a huge obviously here too in Washington but in New Jersey definitely a huge thing in New Jersey so when the Kamana Natural Training Program idea came about it was like here is an opportunity for people to learn on their own about their local ecosystems so they felt empowered to go into the court and put together reports and with scientific evidence where they could go and say, hey, there's endangered species over here. This is wetlands or whatnot. And actually um, say that with conviction and with knowledge so then that land would then stay preserved and not become another development. Where I grew up in New Jersey, there were so many places, wetlands and sensitive areas that were just filled in with dirt and built with houses upon because nobody really, you know, they didn't do it. 
they were able to get away with it because there weren't people that, that knew what to do. So that's that's what I noticed is that you know people actually had it was very it's very deep and very empowering this work. Cattail uh, Supermarket of the Swamp. Why I say that is there's a lot of ways, parts of it you can use. In the spring, in the springtime, you'll see uh, when it's coming up, you'll see the shoots will be about yay big. Even when they get to about yay big, you can cut them up and you can peel them back and you'll get down to a really tender inner part, like a heart. Like it's very, it's, um, it's meaty and white and you peel that back and you can chop that up and put that in a stir fry. You want to cook it first because it might have giardia if you're in a swat, right? You don't want to risk that. So especially with the shoot. Now with the root, you dig that root up and if I had a big shovel with me, I could do that. But it's very starchy. Yeah. It's very starchy. So you can open the slit the root open and you can scrape out all that white starch, dry it out, add it to some flour, you can bake things. So you got the root and you got the shoot. Now you got the flowers, the female part and the male part. So the top part, the female part, um, sorry, the male part has the um, pollen. It's already done, but when it has this pollen, you can turn, you can bend over the cattail with a paper bag and you can shake that out and it doesn't take long to get a nice amount of this cattail pollen that you can use and cut with flour <laughs> and make stuff with like muffins or whatever then what you could do now if you wanted if you find someone could take this with them you could take this off strip this down like that you can take maybe oh we can take it to like here see some pollen there's some pollen on there um, anyway, you can take this, you could steam that or barbecue it or whatever, wow. pour some butter on it and you can eat it like corn on the cob. So, you, so you've got the male part, the female part, the roots and the shoots all edible. So car high carbohydrates. So when you're on a survival situation and you need carbohydrates, cattail roots are always there all year round. You can dig them and have that for survival. And what? And while we're on cattail, not, a, not an edible use, but uh, this stalk here, not the leaves that fan out, but this middle stalk in the fall, when it browns and, and dies, you can take it, and when it's dried out, and it's a great hand drill stalk to use. You can break that off, it's pithy mm. in the middle. It's like big leaf maple or salmon berry or something. <coughs> and, um, and as well as the greens, when do you harvest it for baskets? Um, now? Oh, when this stuff here, yeah, you har like usually you know September, you can har October. harvest that and dry it, and then you yep. can use it to weave baskets weave and baskets mats, or mats. mats. Yeah. So it's a lot of so it's a great. I mean, it's great. You can spend a lot of time studying cattail. Be very careful though, because it absorbs heavy metals really yeah. easily, extremely easily. So make sure it's away from like roadways. But, yeah, here I'd away. harvest it, no problem. It's organic farm. Nobody's spraying anything. Yep. It's far from a road that's not that busy. I definitely, so I, now that I know this, I'll be back. Now that I know this, I'll be back here. <laughs> Thank you.